So I think other people will file in, um, but we'd like to begin. So first, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. My name is Tom Cortade. I'm on the faculty at UC Berkeley. I'd like to welcome you all to this year's um, Meet the Shannon Awardee event, which is organized by the IT Society Student Subcommittee, uh, which is co-chaired by myself and Professor, Professor Eifer Osgur from Stanford University over there. So a little bit about this event if you haven't attended before. This event is aimed at students and postdocs and it's meant to kind of reveal the side of the Shannon awardee that isn't so readily apparent in the papers that they write, okay? Um, in particular, we want to understand uh, what was the Shannon awardee's um, journey, how did they get to where they're at, and hopefully inspire uh, many of the students and postdocs out there. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to begin the event and welcome this year's Shannon Awardee, Professor David Shea from Stanford University. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so what uh, better place to ask you about where your journey started than at the very beginning, okay? So you were born in 1966 in Hong Kong. Wow. Uh, David Ngar Ching She, did I say that correctly? Or maybe... Not Ching, yeah, not Ching. Uh, there's a microphone right there, maybe you yeah. can... Uh... Oh, uh, Na Ching, that's the Chinese Na Ching, okay. And we were told that this means the elegant one, kind and gentle and scholastic, is that correct? Uh, I, think this, I think the scholastic was added on posterior, yes. <laughs> I see, I was going to say that would be quite, uh, quite prophetic. <laughs> on, on anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, so fast forward a few years, it looks like here's a, a picture of you with your family. And it seems to be some sort of uh, graduation event. And so this made us curious, um, was something, uh, was education something that was emphasized all your life? Uh, was it important? And, and maybe you can tell us if anyone in your family kind of guided you towards the <laughs> scientific career. Should I be honest? <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Uh, not really. <laughs> okay. We were kind of focused on television. I think that was the main, uh, main operation at that time. <laughs> in what sense? We spent many hours watching television. I see. Okay. <laughs> yes, maybe that got me interested in communications. Yes. yes. Uh, in wireless communication yeah. in particular. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't cable. That's right. It wasn't cable television. It was broadcast. So the seed was planted early. I yeah. <laughs> it's a success. Is watch a lot of televisions. <laughs> okay, so um I guess if you don't have anything else to say, around, around 10 years old, it, uh, it seems like you moved to Vancouver. We were given this photo and told that. And, and we were just curious. I mean, this must have been a, a big change uh, for you to move from Hong Kong to Vancouver at 10 years old. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit about it and whether you feel it influenced you in any way. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. I, l I thought back at those period of times. I spent three years in Canada. And the school system is very different there. In Hong Kong, it's very rigid, pretty rigorous, rigid system. Uh, so in terms of math, I uh, learned a lot. And when I went to Canada, I said, these people don't know any math, it seems, uh, <laughs> at that level. But then there's a difference, because I think in the North American system, there's more sort of free-flowing education. And I think that has an impact on my future development. So. Uh, rigorous on the one hand, which gives you sort of technical strength, but on the other hand, a little bit more liberal thinking, perhaps, in terms of, you know, I think it helps research in the long run. Mm -hmm. Okay, so speaking of the rigid Hong Kong system, at age 14, you moved back and you entered uh, something called St. Joseph Secondary School. So uh, what was uh, the experience like that like? Oh, that system is uh, entirely based on competition, okay? So we have about 200 such kids sitting there, right? About 200 such kids per year. 
Every year we rank from one to 200. What was your rank? And everyone, else, everyone knows everyone else's ranking. So this is the system that we were in. And what My was own your... ranking is not relevant to this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to give you a few of the, the rankings, the, 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 the type of system that we were brought up. Very competitive, I must say. Unhealthily competitive, perhaps. Uh -huh. But it does also affect me to some extent, yes. <laughs> Care to elaborate in any way? Were you I, aware of the unhealthiness of the system as a as Yeah, a, as I, I think that was not, I was not aware of it when I was in the system. Yeah. But afterwards, looking back, I, I sort of thought it was an, a bit unhealthy. In a sense, you were very aware of your own ranking and somehow you're trying to beat, beat up the other people to <laughs> stay on top. And at the end of the day, it's not just ranking that matters, right? So, the, so I think it's not a very healthy system. But it, it is a rigorous system, so you learn a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's the balance between rigor and perhaps some more liberal thinking. Well, so this kind of system does not really encourage sort of broader thinking because it encourages you to basically study to the exam and get the highest possible score in the exam. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the unhealthiness. The positive part is that you learn you know, a lot of stuff. Was it especially challenging coming back from Canada? Uh, uh, I adapt to the system pretty quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, this person on the right, his name is Mr. Perrick Ching. Yes. And uh, he's the principal of the school now. Yeah. And was he there when, when you were a student? Yeah, so he was the first teacher I got, which was teaching me, um, I would say, real mathematics. Mm -hmm. So he would be teaching things like limit and delta and epsilon definition of limits and a little bit analysis. And that was grade, roughly corresponds to grade 11 or 12 in the North American system. And do you feel like he uh, encouraged you in any particular yeah, way? Yeah, I think he really stimulated my interest in mathematics. And that was really the starting point. I remember that class very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that got me interested in mathematics and I developed further when I went to college. I see. Yes. So, in fact, there's, a, there's an interview, a recent interview with him when he became the principal of the school and we had it translated. Wow. wow. And <laughs> you guys did a lot of research. He, he, this man actually has a quite an interesting story that he wanted to be a mathematician, right. but then when he compared himself to his peers also studying math, right. he decided he would prefer to teach yes. math and try and inspire yes. our next generation of mathematicians. Yes. And uh, Yeah, actually... In my class, there are a lot of people interested in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if people know, but there was a book by Michael Spivak. I don't know if anyone have read that book. I don't know if it's still popular now, but 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was very popular for sure. college. For college. Uh -huh. But people were already reading it in high school. And I was sort of a later, one, later ones. There were already a bunch of people very interested in mathematics. Uh, but interestingly, none of those people actually went to do research. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I did. I don't know why, but I did. <laughs> it's interesting. There's a quote in his interview where it says that he doesn't remember any one student standing out in particular. But, right. Uh, right. He would probably be <laughs> proud of you today, I think. Okay. Yeah, my friend re reminded him. <laughs> my friend is a teacher in that school. Oh, really? He reminded him afterwards, yeah. I see. <laughs> so maybe we should have done a more recent interview. Okay. Okay. Okay, so in 1984, uh, oh. you moved back to Canada for your undergraduate studies, uh, and you obtained your undergraduate degree in systems design engineering. Uh, yes. Uh, from the University of Waterloo, yes. uh, where you also were awarded a gold medal for academic excellence. Yes. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your undergraduate experience? For example, a lot of undergraduate students today get involved in research. Were you involved in any research? And how did you decide that you wanted to do a PhD afterwards? So, yeah, so my undergraduate ended in system design engineering. That was my degree. But I actually started in the Faculty of Mathematics. So Waterloo has a very strong mathematics undergraduate program. There were multiple departments within this faculty, like computer science, combinatorics and optimization, etc. And actually I was in that faculty. And as a result, I took a lot of math courses. But then um, I switched to engineering in the middle, and I thought engineering was something that I needed to do to 
earn money after graduate. My dad told me, my dad is an engineer. He's sitting right there taking pictures right now. You told us there was no early encouragement towards this direction. No, no, no. I, I, Do we have to go back and revisit this slide? Okay. Let me finish. Let me, let me finish. This, is not, this is not early. I, I, this, is, well, this is already this college, is college time. Yeah, so yeah, he told me that I should definitely be an engineer because that's how you, I can make money. Mm -hmm. Studying computer science is no good. No good, because you know I don't want to be a computer technician or something, you know. So I decided to become an engineer, and I went to system design engineer. So system design engineer is a very interesting department, um, because it's a bit related to my talk in some sense. Because system design engineer is basically for people who are outcast in other de engineering departments. Uh, there are people like doing pattern recognition work, which at that time was considered sort of not mainstream. Remember, that was the winter of AI, perhaps, around that time. So it was considered not mainstream, but there were people doing pattern recognition. And there were actually people thinking back. In fact, that's where I learned maximal entry principle. So I learned maximal entry principle taking those courses in that department. Interesting. Uh, but when I went to MIT, I said, like, oh, this is a real information theory. That's what I figured out. I <laughs> and I also remember in your Shannon lecture, you mentioned the system view of your book. Is yes. that somewhat related to your? Uh, I think it's indirectly related. I think it got much more sharper when we interacted with the Rajiv Leroy, as I mentioned. I see. But the system view was very focused on in the system design. So for example, uh, every year we would be doing a project which involves the whole class, which is about 80 students. Each class, each section, each few students respond for a particular subset of a big system project. And the goal was to un try to understand how the, system, system, the different subcomponents interact to build a whole system. For example, we're building a, at that time, sustainable village. So how do you build a sustainable village? Where every, like at this current day, you would call it like zero waste or zero energy. Um, okay, and so shall we go to the next? Uh, slide? Yeah, just one comment. You graduated uh, with a gold medal. Yes. Um, what what was that distinction? Uh, gold medal means the top in the whole uh, school of engineering. Yeah. I see. The whole school of engineering. So it turns out that they maintain a list of gold medal winners on the website, and we couldn't find your name. So we okay, were, maybe it's fake. You should. Uh, you should. Maybe uh, it's fake. <laughs> You should ask them for a correction, maybe. Okay. And, and regarding my other question. <laughs> so I better check my Shannon Award winner list as well in right. the future years. Yeah. <laughs> they may drop it out also. <laughs> and were you involved in research during your undergraduate? Uh, uh, yes, I was doing machine learning research. I see, the, the one on. Uh, yes, in I fact, uh, at that time I learned about um, Vapnik's theory I see. of I see. empirical risk minimization. Oh, I see. Yes. I see. I see. I was trying to do something around that I see. theme. I see. Yeah. I see. That was a research project. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so we go to the next slide. Okay. So in 1989, uh, you joined MIT for your uh, uh, graduate studies. Um, and okay, MIT is obviously one of the top graduate schools in the world. Uh, it must have been really exciting for you. Uh, so how did you feel? Um, when you arrived there. Yeah, so um, it was an uh, amazing place, actually. Um, two mo amazing things are the faculty, the professors, but even more, perhaps, the students. So I was in a lab called Laboratory for Information Decision Systems. So let's see where the lab is. The lab is uh, somewhere there in that corner. It's outside the picture a little bit. I see. <laughs> and uh, we were in the worst building of the whole MIT, and people who know MIT knows that there are already a lot of bad buildings there. And so our building was pretty bad. And then we have, um, you know, this morning's plenary speaker was my office mate. Uh, yesterday's uh, winner of the Ad Aaron Weiner Award was my office mate. So we had a pretty good crowd going. I see, I see. And uh, one of the kind of biggest challenges uh, students usually face early in their graduate studies is deciding on a topic and finding an advisor. So how did that work for you? Like, how did that happen? Uh, did you arrive directly to, to LITS or? Yeah, so we had to do, at that time, we had to do two theses, master's thesis and PhD thesis. So my master's thesis was in learning and system identification, so learning tied with control. 
And that was very quick because I already had a learning background coming in. I see. So it was very quick to identify the problem and I sort of did a thesis within a year or so. And then I decided to switch to communication and that took a long time. It took one whole year before I had any idea what I was going to work on. So it was sort of I see. long time. Yeah. Okay, so we looked on your CV back to your very first few papers. Wow, okay. And, uh, on, I, don't, I don't know what's going to come up later on. The very I'm worried first, about this whole situation here. The very first, <laughs> uh, the first paper here looks like it came out of Waterloo, shape determination for large flexible satellites via stereo vision. So did this come out of one of these undergraduate research projects that you were talking about? Yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, Hepler, was one of my professors at uh, System Design Engineering. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, a, it's an eclectic mix of faculty because he was interested in um, aeronautics, space application, and this was a space application. So we just worked on this problem, yeah. Would you say this is a, maybe a research experience that, uh, that turned you on to research and, and made you want to pursue graduate school, or, or how did you kind of come to that decision Really? Yeah, yeah, I worked on a bunch of these projects, not only this one. This was uh, one of the earlier ones. I see. But I worked on a few because Waterloo also had a um, co-op program. Mm -hmm. So you have to spend uh, many semesters outside the classroom. Uh, most people go to industry and I did that also. But I also stayed on campus to join research groups and do research. So I had five years undergraduate actually. So I had a lot of time to do research. So I spent about maybe two or three semesters doing research, different research projects. I see. And do any stand out uh, besides this one that uh, come to mind? Yeah, so my thesis was actually on learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, as you mentioned. And uh, the funny thing is that recently I've been doing learning, uh -huh. and everything has come back to me. And uh, it seems that what I was doing there was basically independently inventing what Vatnik already did. I see. <laughs> yeah, so the second, I believe this is your second paper down below, and um, this is probably presumably the first paper that you wrote uh, while you're a student at MIT, maybe your master's thesis or, or something, and it, and it seems to be much more aligned with this learning topic, yeah, that's right? Yeah, that's right. And so we heard yesterday that you went to MIT and wanted to do machine learning, which seems uh, maybe many years uh, ahead of the curve. Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, I, I guess you already explained a little bit that in your undergraduate experience there were some people doing this, but, but uh, I guess is there anything else that you'd like to add about what motivated you to pursue this or why you were interested in it at a time, uh, at that time? Yeah, so as I said, uh, there were quite a few professors in my undergraduate interested in AI, pattern recognition, computer vision, and so learning becomes a natural problem once you deal with these things. I see. And my, my professors were very practical professors. They want to build arms that move and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I have a theoretical bent. So I was trying to say, OK, so learning. So how do you theorize? How do you think about formulating a learning model? And I was trying to do that. And as I was doing that, I realized that what I did has already been done, but not very long time ago. It was done by Valiant. I don't know if you guys know Leslie Valiant. Leslie Villain had a very famous uh, paper in 1984, I think in 1984, 1984 on uh, the PAC learning model, prob probably approximately correct. And so I realized that I was kind of reinventing that stuff. And then I read it and I sort of did a bit more of it. But then I realized that actually I was reinventing what Valian was doing, but Valian was sort of reinventing what Vepnik was doing. <laughs> At least you're following. Yeah, so I started following the route yeah. and then I find this uh, Vatnik. And then I kind of forgot about it until these past few years. So I thought, oh, it's all coming back. <laughs> so one other question that I wanted to quickly ask is uh, we, we heard from one of your students about their first experience writing their first paper with you. <laughs> <laughs> And they said Whose name you, you, we should not mention. Yes, but I think the quote was that they uh, wanted to bite you <laughs> at some point because when you suggested uh, rearranging sections four and five of a 50-page paper um, or swapping the sections. So, so what, uh, okay, the first paper writing experience is always a big 
step, I guess, and any particular stories that you'd like to share? Because clearly, I think now, everyone who reads your papers appreciates how kind of eloquent and direct yeah. and articulate right. they are. Right. So, so I'm curious how you developed this. Yeah, I think Gallagher had a lot to do with it. Gallagher was pretty uh, critical about proper writing, but he never tell you how to write. Mm -hmm. He would always tell you what's wrong with your writing, but you have to fix it. So give an example. I would write a draft to him, and then he would, and for one thing, his handwriting is very bad. So it's hardly, first hard to decipher what he was saying. But basically what he said was roughly this. Hey, this paper is missing a first paragraph. <laughs> okay? And I'm supposed to figure out what that first paragraph should be, but it's missing. <laughs> okay, that means I, I introduce the subject at the wrong level. That's what he's saying. So I need to figure out what the right level is. And so that's, that's sort of carry on to me because uh, at least uh, in my early years, maybe I'm losing patience when I get older, but early years I would just tell students, you know, you're not writing properly. And then they have to figure out how to improve it. And that led to sometimes, is he here? Uh, never mind, let's not talk about specific names, but it could lead to, you know, 20, 25 iterations. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's why they want to bite me. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know at that time, though, fortunately. <laughs> okay, Eifer. So, um, okay, so you already mentioned uh, Professor Bob Gallagher, your two advisors at MIT were Professor Bob Gallagher and Professor John Cisiklis. Um and obviously, uh, they are both very famous people. So uh, you already told us about uh, your paper writing experience uh, uh, with, uh, with Professor Gallagher, but we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your introduction with them. What was it like to have them as your advisors? Yeah, so both are very brilliant people. Actually, I started working with John first because uh, John was interested in learning at that time. And then I switched to working with Bob as well as John for my PhD thesis. Both were quite brilliant, uh, but they're brilliant in very different ways. And I think it was at that time that I learned that people can be brilliant in different ways. Uh, so Gallagher is a sort of a broad thinker, I think. He's sort of a, sort of, it gives you lot high level directions. Like example, the hints I gave you yesterday at the Shan lecture. Those were not really exaggeration. I think they were really wisdom. They were really wisdom. Um, but he, I, I showed him this talk actually, before I came here. Not and this he, one, your Shannon lecture. Yeah, my no, Shannon lecture. Slides. Not done this paper, Shannon lecture. And he sort of disowned it. He said, no, I did not tell you these things. But I did, he did. <laughs> um, John Sisiklis, on the other hand, is an amazing problem solver. So I could be stuck on a problem for the whole week. I would present to him and say, I'm stuck. Can you give me some suggestion how to go about it? He said, okay. And then he would sit there. And within one hour, he would come up with four different methods on how to solve it. And at the end of the hour, he almost solved it. And I, said, I stopped him. I said, you know, if you solve it, I'd have nothing to do. Please just hold, st stop here and I'll think about it for the re <laughs> rest see, of the week. I see, I see. So he's that type. And Gallagher never solves problem for me. But Gallagher would always uh, tell me that this, your, your question. So Gallagher is very focused on the question. I see. He's always focused on asking the right question. And so often when I go in and say, hey, here's the problem I'm thinking about. He would be saying, you know, this problem is okay, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So he would always be criticizing my problem formulation. And I think from him, I learned really about problem formulation. So I find that although both are really brilliant people, I learned in some sense more from Bob than from John, I think, because I think it's hard to learn problem solving skills. You either have it or you don't have it. Uh, whereas some sort of problem formulation, I think you can learn. And so that's what I kind of encourage students. And I realized that it's very hard to teach students problem solving skills but maybe I could contribute a little bit on teaching them how to think about problems and develop a certain taste for problems. I see, I see. 
Okay, and do we have, uh, yeah, so this seems to be the only paper you co-authored uh, with both of them. Yes. And I believe this is the main paper from your PhD, right? Uh, that's the only paper from my PhD. That's the only paper yes. from your PhD. There's a story uh, for that, actually. I see, can you? Do you want to hear that? Yes, please. So I had a 250-page PhD thesis. I thought I was pretty proud of it. A lot of large deviation formulas and Markov chains and control of Markov processes. I learned a lot of math writing that thesis. So and then I wrote this first paper, and then I have three other papers that I want to write. So I present that to Gallagher, and Gallagher looked at my proposals, and he said, maybe one is enough. And that's it. I love this one paper. <laughs> 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 Interesting. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um, okay. Less is more approach, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Shall we go to ten? Um, yeah. So um, we heard in your Shannon lecture that these were the two pieces of advice you got from your PhD advisor, uh, Bob Gallagher. Uh, one, don't work on information theory, and then two, keep an eye on wireless. Um, and you said you, you, you eventually took both pieces of advice. Your, uh, your thesis was more on the networking side at the end, and uh, uh, you eventually started to work on wireless. So since this is an event that's mainly intended for students, yes. uh, and now that you yourself are a famous advisor, we were wondering what would be the two pieces of advice you would give to the students in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted me to say don't work on what information theory? <laughs> uh, wow, this is a very hard question. Because, you know, so I'm not going to answer that question. And the reason why is because, in some sense, those advice are kind of personal advice. Because, you see, he did not advise every student to not work on information theory. He advised me to not work on information theory. I see. I see. So, for example, Professor Emre Talakan, who just heard a brilliant lecture this morning, did work on information theory. <laughs> so, you know. So if, if the students <laughs> in the audience want uh, advice, they should come personally to you. Yeah, then. Okay. that's there right. No, and, uh, uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, good. So then, uh, maybe... Yeah. So in 1994, you went to Bell Labs, as we uh, heard yesterday. And I guess uh, now the typical track uh, to becoming an academic is you do your PhD and then postdoc and then you go on. So was this uh, some sort of postdoc? Did you already have an academic position lined up? Or can you tell us a little bit about how this came about? Because we know a lot of people at that period went, went to Bell Labs, so. Yeah, so I was interviewing different places, and, and then I got an offer to Berkeley. And, uh, but at the same time, Bell Labs was interested in me, so I arranged with them to do a postdoc for a year before I joined Berkeley. Um, I, I have a sense that my PhD thesis is not going to lead to a uh, career, <laughs> and I need to do something else. I didn't know what something else would be, but I thought going to Bell Labs would be a good thing to do to explore some new directions. Because I felt that as an assistant professor, you're already pressured to perform right in the beginning, and you have to teach and everything. So I thought one year of break would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. okay. And that was very, turned out to be a very good decision on hindsight. Yeah, that kind of leads to my second uh, um, question, which was, it seems to have been a, a very formative time for you as a researcher, certainly, because, I mean, um, it was when you first got in, involved in wireless, which is what the bulk of your career has been about yes. up to this point. And so, is there anything that you'd like to add to this? I mean, how was it uh, kind of moving to this new area, something different from your, your PhD thesis? Uh, how did you, I don't know, decide to take this plunge. Actually. Yeah, so I think the postdoc is a very interesting experience because unlike the, um, unlike the PhD experience, there was no advisor anymore. So postdoc it, at that, in those days at Bell Labs was not attached to a specific person. You just joined the Bell Labs Merrill Hill math department. So in that department, there were people like uh, Alon was there, Alon Oliski was there, uh, Rajiv Laroya, which I mentioned yesterday, was there. 
uh, Emina, Emina Sojonen was there, Emre Tarata was there, Tom Richardson there, was there, uh, Rudiger Urbanke was there. So there were a lot of people there. <laughs> and that was a really amazing place. There were so many people, and I learned about so many different things. And MIMO, for example, was just being invented. I still remember the first internal talk about MIMO from Forsini Group coming to the math department to discuss MIMO. I was in the meeting. And this is all like appearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a time for myself is I need to be my independently formulating problems, no advisors anymore. At the same time, get exposed to many different things. So it was really valuable time for me, that one year and three months. Yeah. Okay, so we know that we, you were pressed on time, I mean, during your Shannon lecture yesterday, talking about your experience at Bell Labs. So uh, we're just curious if you, you'd like to add anything else, any stories maybe. Yeah, stories. Is Stephen Henley here or not? <laughs> <laughs> Most of my stories at that time were around him. Okay. Because he is, um, all right, so since he told bad stories about me yesterday through Rudiger, let me say a few things about him. So <laughs> we will be discussing, I, I, I was pretty uh, correct yesterday, uh, every night at home we have nothing to do, and we were discussing research, and until he got, until I start noticing that he start drinking whiskey more and more as we discuss research. I said, what's going on here? Why are you drinking more and more whiskey? He said, I need the whiskey to get sleep because we, our research discussion was so intense that I could not fall asleep anymore. <laughs> I see. So, so it was pretty intense. Blood, sweat, and whiskey went yeah, into that. Yeah, blood, sweat, and whiskey, yes. Went into that polymetroid yes. paper. Yes. Okay. So in 1995, I guess, uh, after this short stint at Bell Labs, you joined Berkeley as, uh, as an assistant professor. And of course, you launched a, a very successful career there. You were there for 18 or 19 years, I guess. Um, so one thing that uh, Professor Osgur and I are particularly curious about is uh, what was your career like as a junior researcher starting out? Because uh, she and I are both quite junior ourselves. So, and we know many of the students and postdocs look forward to this position uh, shortly. So, so what can you say on that front? Uh, what aspect of the, do you want to be saying? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, you, you kind of, I think, formulated a research agenda somewhat at Bell Labs, but yes. how right. did you feel about going and then executing it? Were any particular challenges that yeah, you faced? Okay. Yeah. So I must say, I was not really very strategic. It wasn't like I have a particular agenda and I said I want to finish this agenda in a certain number of years. I was sort of at the level, because you know, I o only started very recently in wireless, right? Bell Labs was one year, so it was at most one year. In fact, at Bell Labs I was still doing networking, a lot of networking stuff. And they were actually networking, my patents at Bell Labs were all networking patents. Mm -hmm. And I was working with a networking group at Bell Labs. So for example, Matthias Grosklauser uh, from EPFL was my main collaborator, one of the main collaborators at that time as well as Stephen Henley. But I emphasized Stephen Henley because it was more the information theory side yesterday. So, um, so I was really, don't have a specific research agenda. I was just working on a bunch of problems that I was interested in. And it just happened those problems turned out to be quite important. So it was a bit of a luck. Uh, particularly the polymetroid work that we were working on was really, came out from a math perspective. We I learned about polymetroid earlier when I was doing networking. So that was a, one interesting perspective that I did not have time to talk about yesterday was, you know, um, Gallagher told me to work on networking. But turned out it was a blessing not only because it was a, a fine job, but also because it turns out the skills I learned there is applicable to an information theory problem. And because I came from a sort of a different background than most information theorists, we were able to crack that problem. Because that problem actually has been worked on for quite a number of years. Uh, not necessarily from a wireless perspective, but from a sort of a uh, wide line perspective where your frequency selectivity is actually the same math problem. Uh, so we were able to crack it, I think, because we came from a little bit different background. Both Stephen and I came actually from a networking background. Stephen was a student of uh, Frank Kelly. So that's a value between interdisciplinary research, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Good advice. I was going to ask how you select problems, but you said uh, you just have to be lucky. But, uh, okay. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a slightly more technical question, maybe uh, which, uh, that relates to what you said earlier. So uh, obviously, um, uh, I'm quite familiar with a lot of, uh, with many of your groundbreaking papers in wireless. Um, and I realize that one recurring theme in many of these papers is this idea of joint limits. Uh, I think that's what gives rise to the diversity multiplexing trade-off, what allows you to see that W curve for the Gaussian interference channel and eventually the deterministic model for wireless networks. And indeed, it's already there in your first paper from your PhD thesis, and it also appears in some of your more recent works on sequencing. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about this? Is this a tool that you, or idea, way of thinking that you found particularly useful? And are there any other tools like this that you keep at the back of your mind? Yeah. Um, right. So, yeah, so taking limits is kind of the, uh, one of the main tools in information theory. Um, if you think about Shannon's original formulation of the problem, he was also taking a joint limit. That's true, yeah. He was taking a limit when the block length is large and the, number but, and the rate and the number of messages are scaling exponentially with n, so jointly. If he did not take the limit jointly, then he would not get very interesting results because he would not see capacity emerging, for example. So I think joint limit is inherent in information theory but from somewhat, the get-go. But uh, somehow it wasn't there in, one of the, in some of the, in the prior works to these papers, yeah. right? For example, uh, in the interference channel, people didn't think about taking joint limits in order to be able to see right. how different right. channel gains yeah. interact with each other, but you would rather take a single limit, right? Take SNR to infinity, which would kind, kind of push the channel into one specific regime and yeah. trivialize in some sense. But, I mean, for a lot of these problems, if you take limit in one way only, then you will see that it's not very interesting. Nothing yes. much happens there. And then you will see, for example, if you take the SNR to infinity only, then you'll see something not very interesting. And so when, in some sense, it's a bit of a backward engineering because you get an interesting answer and you realize that the only way to get an interesting answer is to take a joint limit. And so you formulate the whole theory about taking joint limit. I see. So the W curves, to me, the fact that we have such a curve suggested that the method, the way we're taking limit was correct. I see. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a chicken egg, but I think. I see. Because without that taking limit operation, we would not be able to get the Gaussian inference channel capacity within one bit. Because we would not know how to look at the problem. I see. It was a very messy problem. I see. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, we heard in your Shannon lecture that in 1999 uh, you took a leave from Berkeley and you decided to spend six months at Qualcomm, right? And the uh, three lines of code that you wrote in Qualcomm uh, were one of the most impactful things you did, uh, now used in almost all base stations around the world. Uh, so um, I was wondering uh, why as an academic did you decide to spend some time in industry and I think this was even before the time you got your tenure, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so that's right. Th wasn't this a risky decision? Uh, no, I wasn't thinking about a tenure clock and that kind of thing. I, I forgot what was the consideration there. But I think the main reason was, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, was, you know, we work on wireless. I wrote kinds, all kinds of papers about wireless. But you know what? I've never actually seen a wireless system. So that's a bit odd, right? So I decided to go to a place where at least the people I work with have seen the wireless system, and through interacting with them, I would get closer to the actual action. So that's what the only motivation, is to really see the real world and, uh, and try to see whether this theory that we've been thinking about on various problems, do any of them make sense? I mean, is it relevant? I see. It's a sanity check, really. It's a sanity check. So I was not willing to spend my whole career in industry, but I thought spending six months there is okay. Uh, that would give me some sense of what's going on. I see. And as the result of the sanity check, did you get the impression that the theory you were doing was really relevant yeah, and useful? Yeah, the proportional fair scheduler convinced me that what we were doing was relevant. Yes. I see. 
So in 2005, you published your textbook, which, as we heard yesterday, has had a, a lot of success. And in fact, in the preface of this textbook, you quote Gallagher's wise words that uh, good theory should prune the tree of knowledge. I remember seeing that there. And your book um, seems to heed this advice in some sense. So, so we just were curious what the intellectual process was like writing a book. It's clearly very different from writing a paper. And so maybe you could say... Uh, yeah, so when Pramod and I started thinking about writing the book, we were not really sure, actually. Because writing a paper, you get an immediate benefit of publishing something. Right? Something new, uh, uh, hopefully. Writing a book, however, seems a bit like risky. It doesn't seem the benefit doesn't seem to be very direct. How, we could spend two years writing a book and nobody reads it. And what happens? Okay, that's, that's it. And, uh, and there are many books which are not really well read. Right? I mean, there are lots of books out there. And so it was a bit of a risky thing. But what drove us was we realized that uh, many of these things actually fit together. And you cannot uh, reflect this knowledge by just one paper or two papers. It has to be sort of a coherent treatment. So I think what drives us to write the book was we felt that we have something new to contribute as a whole. Not necessarily individual. So individually, the results could not be new. But to take a look at it from a unified thing and try to make everything consistent was a contribution by itself. So that's why we wrote the book. It wasn't just for the sake of just writing a book. Um, the process was uh, onerous. We went through three rounds of iteration. We taught it three times, once at Urbana-Champaign and twice at Berkeley. And every time, we would get students. So what I did was uh, I assigned homeworks. And one of the homework questions always, please criticize this um, chapter that we were writing. So I would have drafted that chapter, and the students would read it, and they would criticize it. What I found was that students are uh, really very critical. <laughs> <laughs> they write like long paragraphs of, say, this is completely ridiculous. We don't understand what this guy is talking about. What do you expect? Do you expect we know a lot of stuff? What's going on? And I said, wow, this is really bad. I mean, and then I realized, and I asked the students, wow, why, you guys are really good. Spend so much time writing. Thank you very much. Although it's negative, it's still useful. And then they said, yeah, the reason is because we couldn't solve any of your problems that you gave us, the technical <laughs> ones. And uh, we could only do this thing. So we thought we'd just spend all our time doing this thing so that uh, we could get some points out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, that was one of the ba major criticism of our book, is that our problems are too difficult. And I think that's correlated with the student's reaction. I see. I see. So um, we have one question for you about the image on this book. Is this spider web supposed to represent the wireless network, or what's uh, oh what's the story? So first of all, the picture was uh, my dad's. My my dad's uh, over there. His photographs is quite beautiful, and um, so the reason why we chose this is because we're interested in uh, capturing the fact that ideas are interlocking. And the web sort of reflects that, mm -hmm. that you have interlocking set of concepts, all connected to each other. So and our book is trying to capture that. So it's not a, whoa, what's this? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. That, oh, 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 oh. OK, yeah. OK, so as we uh, wow. <laughs> gathered from your lecture yesterday, you're, you're known to be a great teacher. In fact, you, you won a teaching award from Berkeley in 2008. Eight, I believe. And so, uh, students, you can write this down. There's a YouTube video with this title. <laughs> and, but um, maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, that was, what was the year? Was it 2008 or something like that? 2007, I think. Yeah, around there. So around that time, there were a lot of um, protests around Berkeley, as usual. But that time was due to the fact that there were a lot of uh, tuition increase. So students were very unhappy, and they were pulling fire alarms over the place to disturb classes. So I was teaching undergraduate probability, I think, here, uh, in the classroom, inside this building. This is the math building. And we were, three alarms were pulled during this one and a half hours that we were teaching. And then at the third one, I got really tired of it. I said, I'm not going to go back again, because this will happen again. And I told the students, you know, hey, there's a 
piece of nice wall out here in the building. The wall over there. Actually, it's even cleaner than the blackboard that we were using. Why don't we just teach on this wall? And so I start teaching. And to my amazement, and that was really um, uh, very appreciative of the Berkeley way, the students actually stayed. Many students stayed to listen to this lecture. They did not go home and say, forget it, this is, this is a stupid environment here to, to learn. They stayed, and it was raining. It started to rain. And uh, I was very appreciative because I felt that, you know, students really come here to learn. And uh, so we should give it to them. And we should not be disturbed by these fire alarms. So I started teaching. I taught for 45 minutes to out here. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. I guess that leads into the next question, which is, um, uh, what is your teaching philosophy? How do you view teaching and research as uh, going together? Oh, I think teaching and research are really hand in hand because teaching depends on good examples, right? Mm -hmm. So, and good examples come from research often. So you do research, for example, I do research in wireless. I would come up with some examples in wireless and I'll use those, ex uh, simplify those examples and use it in teaching a probability course or a stochastic process course. When I, teach, when I do research in DNA sequencing, I would come up with some examples from say RNA sequencing, which leads to some EM algorithms and I simplify that and I use it to teach probability. So it keeps the whole subject li alive. Because otherwise you'd be teaching exactly the same thing you would be teaching 20 years ago. And number one, the students are bored. Number two, you are bored yourself. So if everyone is bored, then there's no point in doing this. So to me, the research is a mechanism of providing relevant and interesting new examples. And does the teaching feed back into your research in any way? Um, yeah, in some sense, writing that book would be a good example of that because mm -hmm. writing that book is a teaching process. Right? Right. We teach off that book and we write off that, that book. I think without writing that book, I, we probably would not be able to solve the Gaussian inference channel to within one bit because that book really gives us a pretty deep understanding of sort of highest in our behavior of wireless channel. Mm -hmm. So that was an example of that. Okay, so 2013 uh, marks a significant change in the direction of your research. Uh, this, is, this is the first year in many where your papers are not exclusively about wireless and we see papers on sequencing, on power networks. Um, so can you tell us why you felt the need to change the direction of your research at this point? And how was it like to suddenly start working on something you know much less about? Right. So I started working on wireless at Bell Labs, right? 95, 96 time frame. So by the time it gets to finishing a book, it was about 10 years. And actually at that time, I was already thinking about changing direction because I thought I finished the book and I'm done. So. I see. But then at that point, I saw, we solved the uh, Gaussian inference channel within one bit. So that kept us going for a few more years, and then I wrote some papers with you on skating laws and some papers on deterministic approaches, and then papers with Mohammed on delayed channel state information. Mm -hmm. So, but by then, I kind of say, okay, really, I need to do something else because I got a bit restless, really, restless, and I uh, want to do something new, something different, and see what happens. I see. So that's it. I see. And how did it feel like now working on a subject that you know much less about? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a really, different process I, I think than it's really before. cool. Okay. It's really cool. You learn. You learn. You feel like... So, for example, I go to conferences in these areas. No one knows me. I don't know anybody. So, it's fine. I mean, I just learn some new stuff and then go on from there. I see. I think uh, one has to be sort of, uh, uh, sort of humble by this kind of experience because you know, I have some accomplishment in information theory, so people here you know, know me. You go to a new place, no one knows you who the, who the hell this guy is, it's fine. I mean, that's sort of a humbling experience, and I think that was a healthy, healthy experience that, you know, you don't know much in this area. People don't know you, you, haven't, you don't have a seat on the table yet. I see. And so you're trying to gain a seat on the table. It's a little bit like an immigrant philosophy, an immigrant uh, psychology. I see. You come to a new country, you work extra hard because you need to be recognized. So I'm a new immigrant in these areas. I see, interesting. Um, okay, and in 2014, uh, 
you moved to Stanford, uh, where recently you were appointed as the Tom Kai Light and Guangam Shu professor. Um, and uh, this more or less brings us to the, to the present day. And because Tom is from Berkeley and I'm from Stanford, we decided <laughs> oh, we will no. not ask you to compare the two institutions. Uh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, Unless, Professor uh, Abbas al Gama may be around, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Is there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we all know of your list of many awards, which one's your favorite? I bolded it up there, the most recent one. Um, okay, but, uh, but you've also received many other awards which have recognized, I guess, significant contributions over the course of your career. And so we just wanted to put up a short list here and ask if any of these represent uh, accomplishments that you're significantly proud of that maybe you didn't have a chance to, to mention yet? Yeah, so I appreciate the Frederick Elburn's term Terminal Award. That was a teaching, that was an education award. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that my contribution a lot is uh, towards education both in terms of um, teaching, in terms of textbook, and particularly in terms of uh, advising students. I, I spent quite a lot of energy on those direction, and I was happy that I was recognized for that. Right. And that I did not emphasize much yesterday because I was focusing more on the research story. So for example, um, I, the, the quarter earlier, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to teach information theory in sort of a bit of a modern way, and that took up some of my energy. So, yeah, so teaching to me is a very thing worthwhile to do. And also I try to integrate it with the research rather than think of it as a separate activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, just for those who don't know, the Frederick Emmons Terman Award is awarded to someone who's written a textbook, correct? Uh, I mean, it's, it's awarded for teaching and education in general, but I think one of the requirements I believe, is... I believe so, I'm not completely sure whether that's a requirement, but uh, most people have a textbook, yes. Okay. Most winners have a textbook. Okay, so speaking of students, um, we got pictures of all your former PhD students. Now, of course, you have lots of other former uh, postdocs as well, but uh, so we chose to restrict the, the picture to PhD students, though, um, uh, just as, a, as to be symbolic of your of your mentorship. And when we look at uh, these students here, I mean, there seems to be some correlation. Uh, amongst their successes. They've all had very successful careers. And in fact, during your lecture yesterday, you said that uh, um, one of your most important or one of your most significant outputs is people, not papers. And so clearly, um, mentorship plays a crucial role in the development of, of these people. So, so what advice do you have for how to be a good mentor? Um, and maybe is also what makes a good mentee. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure if I'm a very good men mentor, actually. I think... Uh, the, the evidence suggests otherwise. <laughs> right, right. Uh. <laughs> okay, good uh, advisor, let's say. Um. Yeah, I think a really good mentor is one who can... Um, adapt to the style of the, t of the student, bring out the strength of the student while trying to improve on the weaknesses. I think that would be an ideal mentor. And I know some people who can accomplish that ideal. Mm -hmm. I think I cannot, I don't think I've, at that point, at that stage, I try to be, but I think I, um, I try to challenge the, I think my style is a bit of a challenging style and it's good for some students and not so good for others. And uh, I tend to try to challenge the students to sort of respond uh, to sort of, you know, uh, a little bit of criticism perhaps, respond to them. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. Um, oh, wow. Had a little more? Okay. We are getting ready to close, uh, and obviously your academic family is not your only family. This is your real family, and here in this picture we see you with your wife, Leah, uh, and your daughter, uh, Hedy. 
Uh, and uh, who is this woman on the right? Is she also from the family or? Uh, I guess she's Hedy Lamar, right? Hedy Lamar. Yes. Yeah. So Hedy is named after her. Do people know who Hedy Lamar is? I think maybe, maybe you should you can, explain. Yeah, you can, oh, okay. yeah, you can so, tell us who she is. Oh, Hedy Lamar was a Hollywood actress in the 30s and 40s. Uh, very famous ones, um, as you can see, quite beautiful. But she was also an inventor on the side. And in fact, uh, she invented uh, one of the earliest forms of spectrum communication, frequency shift keying. He worked with an inventor, to, to, uh, and it's inspired from piano keys, on how to do frequency shift keying so that you could avoid um, Nazis uh, submarine attack, and uh, f so you can sort of uh, hide the communication. I see. So that was her, her biggest invention, and she was trying to push it for the, to the U.S. Navy, but they didn't uh, accept it at that time. But that was one of the earliest patterns, maybe the earliest pattern on space spectrum communication. So, so beauty and uh, brains. So that's what we want our daughter to be. I see. Very nice. And uh, I think we saved the, uh, the hardest question to the end. Uh, so the main quest in your uh, Shannon lecture was to try to define the future of information theory and you encouraged us all uh, to diversify information theory and try to carry its spirit to other domains. Um, so how do we do this? <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys create good slides, but you're a little bit lazy in your question preparation. <laughs> <laughs> we had other questions, but we uh, yeah. tried to be as direct as possible. How would, you, how would you suggest, I mean, to the students who are out there who will go and presumably build their careers by pursuing other directions and uh, broadening IT and carrying a spirit forward, what advice do you have to them? How, how should they go about that? Um, I kind of thought that was the main point of my lecture yesterday, but just to repeat on that point a little bit, elaborate a little bit more. Um, so I guess I titled my talk as the spirit of information theory. I did not title it as the future information theory. But we are asking you, yeah, maybe, maybe you can comment on the future too, like the future. Right, so that's why I did not, because um, it's hard to forecast the future, I think. But I guess my point was that we should try to be prepared, we should be broad, and we should try to explore many different directions because technology is changing very fast. There are many different places where technology is changing. And when technology is changing, there may be opportunities for us. Uh, sequencing technology is one example. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, if we, our field had start enter sequencing earlier, we would probably be making bigger impact already at this point. Sequencing started in the early 2000. Uh, I still remember it actually. There's a guy called Gene Myers. So Gene Meyer was a, one of the key figures in human genome sequencing. He was the one who came up with these algorithms to do assembly in the first generation. He was a professor at Berkeley. He was at Berkeley for two years. If I had interacted with him then and said, hey, let's see what's going on here, something new. Maybe I would be doing sequencing at that time already, and I would be making contribution earlier on. But I did not, because I was focusing on wireless. This guy is sequencing, I'm wireless. What's nothing to do with him, let's not talk to him. So I never even talked to him. So I would like to sort of encourage people to be open, uh, talk to people. You know, the, we, we, are, we spend time at universities. Uh, university, one thing good about university, is not a specialized research lab. There are many, many different departments doing many different things. So you take different courses, you learn different things, and then you try to figure out whether you can contribute. I think that's, the, uh, that's what I encourage my students to do, and they take courses from all over the place, biology, statistics, physics, and so forth. I see. Okay, uh, so you're saying not just things directly relevant to your research at that point, but trying to keep yeah, an eye on what's right, happening right, around you. Right, and right. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, I think okay, uh, so I think that basically brings us to the end. With that, we'd like to um, wow. thank everybody <laughs> who contributed to this uh, presentation and thank everyone for attending. And 
I think we have a few minutes before the talk starts, so I'd like to take the opportunity to see if there's any quick questions from the audience. Questions? Okay, we must have answered them all, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so. Okay, Great. so I would like uh, to ask everyone to thank Professor David Shea again and also congratulate him on his <laughs> award.